I imagine you're all very familiar with Pierre's work. Uh, he came to fame in 2003 with uh, Vernon Godlittle and swept the literary uh, scene off its feet, really. Uh, and in 2006, he published Ludmilla's Broken English. Uh, and now, quite recently, he's just brought out light, Lights Out in Wonderland. Uh, this is an, a rollicking circus tale, really. Um, we've been talking about this for months. And it's, it's a tale that, uh, that will take you from London to, Ber to uh, Tokyo to Berlin and is a tale of pure decadence. Um, it's, it's typical of Pierre's work and hopefully he's going to read uh, some of it for us today. Um, so yeah, well done. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for coming out of the morning. We were kind of half expecting there would only be enough of us to, uh, to round up a small group and go to the pub. As Instead, we bought the pub here. Yeah, as it is, um, <laughs> in honor, a lot of people won't realize you'll be the first to know that um, although it, uh, it does seem uh, a wild tale, and in many cases a, um, an improbable tale, that most of the things in this book are real. Most of the settings, and certainly all of the magical icons uh, and it's the result of a lot of research and a lot of luck trying to find the most, not only decadent, but unexpected uh, best things in the world. <laughs> so it has the very, very uh, best decadent perfume is uh, a magical icon in the book. Um, and there's also a magical wine, which is real. Uh, which has uh, extraordinary properties and which by uh, coincidence is also made here in Australia on a very, very rare piece of ground, very small piece of ground with some uh, prehistoric minerals on it. And we're lucky enough not only to have some of the wine, which we're enjoying here uh, during the course of the hour, you might see us sort of float away with, uh, but uh, even the winemaker himself having found himself uh, included in a book, has, has joined us to say hi. So all of the bits and pieces that we need are here. Coming together. Yeah. Mm. Now, I was just wanted to start off by asking you um, about a previous statement you said uh, not long ago by saying that the three books actually form a loose trilogy of fictions. Yep. I was just wondering where this might come in the trilogy and how it fits in. Um, it's true. The, um, all the books, Vernon God Little, Luke Miller's Broken English, and Lights Out in Wonderland, between them form a loose trilogy. So they're completely independent. You don't have to read them together. You never need to read more than one if you don't want to. But between them, I uh, wanted them to be a snapshot, a very dark snapshot of the first decade of a new millennium. Because it seemed to me that uh, we're in a curious limbo between ages. We, I know we've gotten very used to the way things are. We've gotten very complacent and, and convinced that, we're, that we've reached a peak of progress and civilization. Uh, but I think the truth is, while we're all busy uh, downloading ringtones, that we've actually hit a very interesting point in that the ideologies which have always ruled uh, human societies have kind of run out. Communism died last century. Uh, pretty much. Uh, we're in late capitalism at the moment, which uh, at the very least is going to need a hell of a tweak to be made to serve a, a society and not to simply serve uh, business. And so we're in this curious period. Nobody's talking that much about it yet, but I think we're in a curious period where ideologies have gone. Um, the government of Great Britain, for the first time, is a management team and not a government in that uh, there is no ideology. They're simply sweeping up the mess. Um, people didn't really know who to vote for because the left has stepped to the right of the right and the right has stepped to the left of the left and no, the center has shifted around and all of that's become very blurred. And I think you, we're going through that here at the moment as well, a question of actually what, to, you know, why are we here and what do we stand for? Mm. And so the trilogy was to reflect the the three things which I thought would be crucial in the coming century, and they were uh, mass media, 
immigration and free market capitalism. And so each one takes uh, an adventure and uh, makes an observation on, on those mm. strands. Mm. Would you call it a political book? Well, I wouldn't have done, but I do now. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, was, I was talking to someone yesterday, it's very strange. One of the, uh, one of the things that's important uh, to me about writing is that these works are also adventures for me. Um, I don't know how anyone else writes, but uh, I never sit down with an idea or a result uh, intending to preach it and, and try and put something across. Rather, I set off on an adventure. And so, as you read the book, um, you'll be on that same adventure, and I don't discover things until they happen um, in the same way that you will discover them as you read the, the work. So, I, I set out in a direction to capture a feeling. And um, hopefully this will, you know, th this captures something relevant to the yeah. time anyway. But uh, I made the discovery along the way that it was probably a political book in a, in a loose sense. Um, it doesn't really put forward an ideology, but it does observe a lack of ideology. And it, it, uh, it works through what we've lost in the last century. And it has a look at why communism didn't work and why it did work. And why capitalism doesn't work and why it, why it does work. And it's just like a, uh, a quick revision of where we're at before we move on to the next stage of, of history, which we don't know what that will be yet. Is it hopeful? I mean, well, the, yeah, well, humanity always does. I mean, we're up and down across time and, uh, mm. you know, something will come. Uh, the reason the work is decadent is because the British Empire is dead and that's now very clear. Um, and so the, uh, the British Isles are in a very real decadence with all the same things that attended the fall of Rome mm. and all other decadences before it. And so that's an interesting period of, as well. And of course that in time will turn into something else and, uh, uh, and grow back up. But mm. we're in that limbo in between times and I find that very interesting. I think that was reflected too in um, the protagonist, Gabriel. And traditionally Gabriel's known as the, the trumpet blower for end times. And uh, I found that fascinating how you've kind of used that idea of end times. And it's almost like uh, doomsday is upon us. Um, yeah. Do you have that in mind? Yeah, well, very much so, yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with all the things the, the character does and says, but, um, but I, do, I do feel along with him that we are in, a, in an end time. We're certainly at the end of, uh, of an era. Um, and we're just now working through all the bits and pieces that we can save from the past and see what we keep and what we chuck away. Mm. But we're going to have to chuck away a lot, I think, and mm. just have a sense. And so we'll see what happens. And he's, uh, the character spends the book um, on a suicide mission and in the meantime discovering uh, all those bits and pieces that have gone to make uh, history in the last century. Growing up in Mexico, um, do you think that uh, the Aztec kind of storytelling and um, the idea of you know, this doomsday is going to come, do you think that that's influenced your writing at all? I'd never thought about it. No? No, I'd never thought about it. It could be. Um, I'd never thought, I'm not, because I'm not looking at, at this question and the character's not looking at it in a, from a magical thinking perspective. <laughs> Uh, so he's not imagining uh, any kind of destiny behind this, but simply that we've run out of ideas. Like even even the uh, the tools of reason that we inherited from the Greeks uh, have have become corrupt and broken down. So we're in you know, we're in a situation where even the democratic idea mm -hmm. doesn't really serve a society as much as it could, mm -hmm. I think, and it doesn't even serve the government anymore. I mean, most time is spent. Um, becoming elected and re-elected mm. and not particularly, it's not really in anyone's interest to govern boldly uh, and it might even be impossible to do so we're kind of we've run out of ideas you know, the tools are, have washed out and mm. it's going to take some, some major change to, uh, to start the thing back up mm. I mean one option has always been just to drop out and to sort of indulge in this you know, constant annuity um, through drugs and you know and whatnot. Yeah. Um, are you very aware that talking about such um, 
ferocious drug taking and drinking and, and all the behaviours that go with it. Do you think that that romanticises the idea of a tortured artist you know, um, and writing this way in your style? Mm. It does, but it's a good time for the tortured artist. Mm. It really is. <laughs> Although, I mean, it, I don't know if it's great for arts. It's, it's, um, I think it's self-evident that there is, there's a genuine decadence um, with an epicenter in Great Britain. And that's only to be expected. Of course, they've, they've had their empire. They've controlled much of the world's surface for, for a couple of centuries. And, um, uh, and that's now just sinking beneath the waves. And the last thing that they have is the Second World War. And that's still on the television every night. We can re relive that triumph. Um, but the rest of Europe's kind of <laughs> forgotten about that. And um, there's not much left. Concord's gone. All the icons of uh, progress are gone. Um, and uh, the society has decided it's a good time to, to have a drink. <laughs> and they're doing just that. And um, I find it a beautiful time. I don't argue against it. I mean, it's just a, the, the ebb and flow of history. Um, and it's the end of a cycle, and the next cycle is yet to begin. And you know, it's a nice time to take stock, mm -hmm. and a bloody good time to have a drink. <laughs> so we we should do that okay, while we can. Pass it with all the research in the book, I suppose. Well, the research was hell. That's why you see me looking so tired. <laughs> it's been a, a difficult book to research um, and to find all the the most decadent things that uh, that I could find. But many of the adventures and all of the settings in the book are real. Uh, many of the people in the book are real, uh, and so it's made up just like uh, just like modern media. It's made of real things, um, but uh, of stories summarily told and interpreted by other people. And so it's um, it's larger than life, but but everything is real. It might seem implausible, mm. but uh, it uh, it all does exist, pretty much as written. When you were researching Bud Miller's Broken English, you spent a lot of time in Armenia. Um, did you do that um, researching for the, for the parts in Tokyo and Berlin? Berlin. Um, Berlin I did, yeah. yeah. Tokyo, um, I based uh, there's a, a scene in a fugu restaurant where uh, somebody has a little bit too much fugu and uh, has, a, has a bad result. And that's actually based on a, a true story, on a uh, a famous Japanese actor uh, who was a living national treasure actually um, who had a few drinks and had a bit too much fugu uh, became paralyzed and died a while back but as for Berlin which takes up the the majority of the setting uh, I did exhaustive research and spent a lot of time there over the last uh, three years and saw many things which I never thought I would see you mentioned um, a lot of the action takes place in Tempelhof Airport, yep. uh, and is essentially the w the climax of the book kind of occurs in this airport. Do you want to just describe the the airport and how you kind of had access to it? Yeah, I was I was interested first of all in Berlin because it is. I mean, it kind of dawned on me over the last few years uh, what a crucial what a crucial place for. 20th century history that city was and how much of a hammering they've taken it's a, I mean we have never lived through uh, phases that were as strong and different from each other as the city-state of Berlin has done for instance uh, in the space of less than 25 years in, in, in the 20th century Berlin went from probably the most riotous decadence, uh, modern decadence, to uh, Hitler's fascism, to communism, and back to, uh, back to regular yeah, European democratic rule um, in, t in different sections of the city. Um, and it's just it's such a whirlwind of change happened there. It was like the plug hole of history uh, and uh, also it literally had a wall running down it which divided the two main ideas of the 20th century and on one side were communists and on the other side were capitalists um, and it was the most 
the most sharply divided uh, and most obvious place to set a work mm. which reflected on, um, uh, on what we had, what didn't work and what did work. Uh, so I was fascinated with that. And in the city, of course, it's still full of, uh, of relics from the Nazi era and, and from before that. Uh, and one of these was, at the time it was built, the largest single building in the world. Uh, it was one of Hitler's big uh, dreams. He wanted to... He had a department um, th which was concerned with a very interesting idea. It was concerned not with building buildings uh, for their functionality, but with building buildings which would be impressive ruins across all of history. And so they were looking also a thousand years down the track or more and they wanted something so monolithic that into throughout history it would be immovable and would even form a nice ruin uh, when it was empty and decayed. And um, one of these was Tempelhof Airport, which was going to be uh, Berlin Central Airport. It's still there. It's right in the middle of town. It's a, over a kilometer long in one structure. It uh, has between 5 and 10 kilometers of tunnels and bunkers underneath it. And um, typically Berlin, Berlin's a very poor city, and it's basically bankrupt. Poor but sexy is what the mayor calls it. <laughs> um, and so there hasn't been the money to, to, uh, to clean up after much of their history. And so there's, there's lots of things lying around still from the war and before the war. There's still rubble from the war. There's still a lot of walls in central Berlin that, are, that are, uh, have shell marks and bullet holes. and So it's very... It's, you can really touch the 20th century there. Uh, and I thought to, uh, to set the final decadent scene of this book, where better than that mm. monolithic structure, which I think is still the third largest in the world after Ceausescu's palace and after the Pentagon in Washington, uh, but completely empty. Uh, the airport occupied a little part of it for a while, and that shut, and part of the timeline of the book is, is the closing down of that after 70 years. Mm. And now it's empty, and uh, being Berlin, uh, they don't know what to do with it, so they've just left it open, and you can go and wander around. You can skateboard up and down the runway, and it's just there in the middle of town, uh, and that's that. It's a very, very living history. Mm. Uh, at the end of the book is about a, a very decadent banquet taking place. Somebody, somebody seizes it for a secret party. And I was pleased to see about six weeks ago, uh, since Tempelhof's closed, that um, some enterprising youngsters used it as a rave venue <laughs> and took it over one weekend and had probably the biggest rave the world has ever seen and uh, disappeared next morning. Which is probably an extension of the, uh, the party that occurred at Gestapo headquarters in your book. Um, yeah. In, in a similar sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's another vacant place in the city which is now still... You know, Blackened and doesn't even have any lights. Or anything. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's very strange. I mean, the the whole place is fascinating. I was never particularly interested in uh, Germany. Um, my father, an Australian, actually flew Lancaster bombers over Germany, and so he will have had a different view of Berlin than than I've had mm. through clouds of smoke and and flame, I guess. Um, but beyond, a very interesting thing happens in our culture that our our viewpoint of the country is so completely clouded by the Second World War still. Um, and in Britain, that's very much the case. I mean, you, you can't really refer to Germany on any level without making a, a, a joke or without referring it back to, to the times of the war. And when you go there, it kind of dawns on you what, what a fractional piece of history that is and, and uh, how much more interesting stuff went on. Uh, but the city is still, it's like a, it's like a playground, like a, an adventure playground for the 20th century, because everything's still there. And there was a, you'll see a scene in the, in the book where from a bar, from a, uh, what must be a fifth or sixth story bar in the middle of Berlin, very decadent bar, if you look out across the lights at night, you see an absolutely black hole in the city where the, the cityscape just stops and no light escapes whatsoever. It's as if somebody's cut out a piece of Berlin right in the heart. And when you ask about this, it turns out that that is Gestapo headquarters. 
and also the Prince Albrecht Hotel, where the SS was based, um, where, where the, the most heinous crimes of the 20th century and possibly of all history were engineered. Um, and of course that was bombed during the war, but nobody knew what to do with it. It's the most evil address in the world. They're not going to rent space there. Um, at the, when, when Berlin fell in 1945, the Russians arrived. Um, uh, they carved up the city, and somebody then threw a fence around that block where Gestapo headquarters was, and just left it. And successive governments haven't known what to do, and they've left it. And there is there is just what is now a genuine jungle, mm. a literal triple canopy jungle with lianas and uh, over, over an undergrowth, which has just been left there for what seventy years or mm. more. Um, without any attention having been paid to it. And so there's there's a scene in the book where they, they, they go over the fence at night and have a party in there. We, we actually did that <laughs> just to see if it could be done. They've now changed the fence. You can still go over, but it's a little bit higher and sturdier than when we went. Um, but it just seemed implausible that you could see, you could probably sit in Goebbels' office space in the foundation underneath the triple canopy jungle in the middle of the capital of the third most industrialized nation in the world, right in the city center. It's as if a block away from here, there was something like that. And of course, people have forgotten it's there, and you just drive past it. And mm -hmm. so all of this just seems such a living example of, uh, of important history that was just there, ready to discover mm -hmm. and, and, and to make you think back of all the amazing things that have happened that have got us to this point. Um, and now, you know, as we look forward and wonder what's going to come next, you can't help but refer to what did and didn't work. Mm. And neither thing worked in the end. Communism went quicker than capitalism, but capitalism, I think, now is showing up in the form it's at, is kind of showing that it, it's not really, uh, not really uh, uh, meant for societies in the way that it could be, and a, a few very basic, a few very basic flaws have shown up, and so where that will go, um, and where we will head uh, as people, mm -hmm. um, was much easier to think about in a setting like this. I hope that works in the book as well. I think it works amazingly well. Um, we've spoken about a couple of the the real um, sort of tangible objects which you've used in the book. Um, could you talk a little bit about the characters? Because I know that the characters. Um, Gabriel is the protagonist, and then he has a has a friend, Nelson Smuts, the, uh, the swaggering stalwart of Nebrians, I suppose. Yeah, um, a chef. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There's some uh, good recipes in the book as well. Amazing recipes. Reflect our obsession with food. <laughs> Actually, we might want to talk about that. I mean, cause that, you use that quite um, quite poignantly. Yeah, it but it's a, it's a decadence. Um, it's very easy. I'll read you a little thing from... from uh, 19th century Paris, which had its own decadence. Um, but it's, uh, it's very easy. To, all the things which attend a decadence, there have been a number of decadences. Of course, every empire collapses at some point uh, and is replaced. And in the same way that, uh, that ancient Rome, uh, with all its very uh, carved, blondine, tall, uh, statuesque people, was replaced by... Um, corrupt taxi drivers mm. at a certain point in history and Rome went away um, so is happening now and there's also always an obsession with food things become more and more extravagant and the food theme was one that interests me a lot so it runs through the book and um, we even have recipes for your own decadent banquet at the end of that seven very very good recipes if you get the and ingredients these recipes that include panda paws Yep. Um, panda wrist. Panda wrist. Yep. Yeah. Um, koala legs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and kiwis. Kiwi broth, is it? Kiwi and hummingbird yeah. broth. Yeah. Uh, milk fed are tiger, are edible, tiger edible cub. Edible recipes. Well, they are. They've been worked on by a master chef, uh, consulting with zoologists and and vets, because some animals are harder than others to cook. Um, <laughs> or acquire. But they've sussed out. Yeah, but if you get one, well, koala shouldn't be too hard, and that <laughs> takes care of one common Australian pest. So it's a, <laughs> something we can do with them. 
the tiger cub a little bit trickier, and cats aren't good eating, but they've they've worked out by doing a, a double cooked confit <laughs> over time that <laughs> they've been able to make a a palatable tiger cub belly dish, which is very good, and uh, all the other ingredients are easily available. <laughs> and you could probably substitute, if you were really pushed, you could substitute um, the tiger belly for maybe a pork belly and maybe the kiwi and hummingbird broth you could do with pigeons or partridges. So if you're creative, I'm sure they still work.